excavated between 1962 and 1972. The archaeologist that excavated it, Dr. Charles Rosaire, and his assistant, George Kritzman, were California archaeologists. He had his PhD from UCLA, and he just happened to meet the owner of the land, who was a famous artist, and he had an exhibit at the Southwest Museum where Dr. Rosaire was working. Uh, after talking, convinced Rosaire to come up and excavate the site. And so with volunteers and students, he worked on it off and on seasonally. Unfortunately, I uh, never wrote it up. I never got it analyzed because he was a very busy archaeologist. He had an active career. But fortunately, the artifacts were preserved and the collection ultimately was kept intact. And then it was donated to the Verde Valley Archaeology Center. One of the spectacular things as a result of analyzing the materials are the plant remains. Having worked in the Southwest for 40 years, most of the plant remains that I've been involved with are things that you can barely identify and you have to bring specialists in to determine even what it is. But the plant remains that we have at this site are so well preserved that sometimes I joke my audiences that I just went down to the supermarket and picked it up for the show because they look like they could have been actually, you know, in your kitchen for a few days. There were a lot of wild plant products that they ate. Uh, there's a very abundant diet, pinon nuts, acorns, ski pods, acacia seeds, juniper seeds, Indian tea or Mormon tea, and even wild grapes. So the Sonawa at this rock shelter, and we assume others that uh, were pot hunted before archaeologists could excavate them, were actually living pretty well in the Verde Valley. We also have a lot of agave that was roasted, both the uh, the bases, uh, which is would have been part of the heart, which is a very important part of the historic Native American diet today, and then also banana yucca fruits. And so the fruits that look like little mini bananas that grow prevalent all over Arizona uh, also were eaten and apparently are, are very tasty as well. And we have the seeds uh, even from them indicating that they were collecting them right off the plant and then taking them back home and then roasting them just like they roasted the agave. And what I think is really remarkable, we actually have choya buds with their flowers on them still. I mean, this is just hard to believe uh, that we would find flowers that preserve. Some of you that were Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts remember making a fire the Indian way. And uh, here we have the, uh, the toolkit for making fires. And you can see that some are well used and some are not so well used. But clearly, fire would have been important. And they didn't have a big lighter, so they had to create their, their own fires. And uh, when I did some research on fire making, I was surprised to find that some Native Americans were so good at lighting fires that most of them could light a fire in two minutes with, with this and, and a, a stick that they would rub. Uh, to get the spark with some tinder and get a fire going. And then what was really remarkable were the reed arrows. And what's really interesting, because I did a study of these arrows, is that no two are alike. Each one is unique, which is confusing to me because when you read the literature, they say that, well, we think American Indians painted their arrows so they know uh, whose arrow belonged to who. So if that's the case, why do we have 40-something arrows that are all entirely different then? And in fact, some of my informants tell me, no, 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 we know which arrow it is. We don't have to paint it to tell who's arrow it is. Uh, it would be important to know which arrow because if several people are hunting, they want to know who actually shot the deer, you know, because they get a larger portion. So uh, there's something uh, to the identity hypothesis, but they're beautiful designs. And we even have one of the arrows that still has one of its feathers on it, and it's a great horned owl feather. Again, to have this kind of preservation is pretty unusual for central Arizona. And you can see here where the sinew, uh, which is a ligament from a, probably a deer, uh, was uh, used to attach the feather. And then uh, the upper part, which is missing, would have attached it here. And this would have been one of the three fletching that would have once been present on this arrow. And a big surprise for me when I studied the four shafts, the arrows are composite arrows. So the shaft is made of reed, which they secure with uh, probably pitch and also occasionally with sinew wrapping. And that was then split at the end to put your stone projectile 